Okay, well, thanks, uh, Dave, and it's really great to be uh, back here uh, in um, Rosansky Hall and certainly um, uh, you know, look forward to having uh, an opportunity to, to, to talk to you about something I've been doing a lot of work in over the past 25 to 30 years, but um, more, more recently, um, working with colleagues within Ag Canada as well as OMAFRA in terms of looking at composted uh, bedded pack barns and their applicability here in Ontario and many, many of the research questions that I think are in front of us in terms of those systems. Um, so I do want to highlight um, uh, some of my colleagues. Um, we're starting to develop a bit of a working group uh, related to um, exploring more of these compost bedded packing operations and what we can do in terms of supporting some of the composting considerations, but also some of the broader management issues as well. So Tom Wright, who's a dairy uh, cattle specialist uh, here with OMAFRA, Christoph Wand uh, with OMAFRA as well, Andy Vanderzeg, who's a... Um, uh, a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Ottawa. And we've actually hired uh, two OMAFRA summer students this summer to start to do some preliminary work to really help position a number of longer-term opportunities for research in this area. Um, and I, I know that many of you are certainly are familiar with compost bedded pack barns. Um, certainly they're an alternative uh, dairy management system. Certainly over the past hour we've heard, heard a lot about different types of, of bedding approaches and, and techniques. Certainly, um, uh, a lot of um, uh, the development of these systems have, have established in the United States. Certainly, they were originated in Virginia, I believe, in the 1980s, and certainly more widely adopted in the early 2000s in Minnesota, and certainly are gaining considerable popularity here in Ontario. And at last count, we figure there's about 50 to 60 um, compost bedded pack uh, operations um, here in, uh, in Ontario. Still fairly small, representing you know, probably the ballpark of about 2% of the, of the industry. Um, but certainly, um, my sense is that there's an opportunity for, this, for that uh, kind of production system to grow in the years to come. And, and certainly, one of the key attributes is there's not a lot of research looking at some of the considerations regarding animal behavior related to these systems, some of the other environmental considerations regarding these, as well as some of the herd health considerations as well. So certainly our plan moving forward is to really start to develop a bit of a strategy for how we can better quantify some of these issues. Um, so, as you're well aware, certainly the majority of these compost bedded pack barns actually have um, uh, alleys that are dedicated for, uh, for, for feed, uh, for milking, and then certainly um, a, a, a significant area for the compost bedded pack to exist. This is um, a, an operation that uh, we were at just north of Guelph a couple months ago during a day when it was minus 25 degrees Celsius outside, one of those cold spells right after the holidays. And uh, they just completed their tillage operations, opened up the door, and you can see the significant fog uh, that's occurring. One of the issues that we've heard from a lot of producers is concern about fog during the colder periods of the year. But within five minutes after the tillage activities were completed, um, we saw certainly a number of the herd actually utilizing those packs uh, for, uh, for, for resting. And so, um, you know, uh, this is one of the sites that we're going to be working on as we move forward to better understand some of the considerations regarding compost. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, so certainly, you know, I think it's important for everybody to be aware that, you know, compost is certainly something that, that occurs continuously and naturally in, the, in, our, in our environment. And it's, it's important to recognize it's a biological process. Uh, where um, microorganisms, uh, including bacteria and fungi, actually break down organic matter and, uh, and over time break it down into a stable end product that has a substantially reduced volume of that, uh, that original organic matter. And so, so certainly it's an area that there's been a lot of research in over the years, but certainly not a lot in terms of how we can build these into considerations around uh, performance uh, optimization within these compost, back, uh, compo compost bedded pack burns. It's important to recognize for compost that there's a number of key elements of compost that all need to be considered. And certainly our experience has been is that every different operation is different, but understanding some of the key attributes and fundamental principles regarding compost will really go a long way in terms of optimizing the performance of these. So key for us is certainly is understanding um, the, the carbon uh, and, and the carbon uh, bedding material that's being used and then build that into your planning. Certainly nitrogen plays a key important role in the success of compost, as does um, sufficient oxygen to really help with respect to the composting uh, process, as well as moisture content of that compost pack. 
So, so in terms of looking at these, I think it's important to kind of break down these four key attributes in terms of supporting success within uh, compost systems. So as you're well, all well aware, certainly feedstocks, including raw manure, you know, bedding materials, nutrients, carbon, nitrogen, as we've already talked about, water, and in some cases, soils, are the feedstocks that are input into a composting system. And certainly some of the uh, considerations, again, as we've already talked about, is that oxygen is an important element in that compost success. Um, key to this as well, though, is the fact that certainly there's a tremendous amount of evaporation that takes place off the surface of compost systems. So therefore, the fog considerations that we showed you in that slide earlier. The key thing, too, with compost, if it's done properly, a tremendous amount of heat is being generated from these piles. So better understanding the heat loss from these piles and how you can maximize that heating for an extended period is going to be really important in terms of the performance of these systems. Other considerations is a tremendous amount of CO2 as well as ammonia and in some cases methane emissions coming off compost packs that need to be considered. So over time with these feedstock inputs and through an effectively managed compost, certainly at the end you're going to have a uniform uh, end product that um, uh, really can provide a huge amount of benefits uh, for crop production as well as uh, other uh, opportunities. Um, so in terms of the key attributes of, of uh, composting, certainly it's important to recognize the balance between the amount of carbon in your system and the amount of nitrogen in your system. Carbon functioning primarily as the energy source and nitrogen is essentially the source of proteins and enzymes to really help with that decomposition. So the relative balance of carbon to nitrogen or the carbon nitrogen ratio is really one of the key attributes or parameters for successful composting. Um, what we're looking for in terms of the uh, active composting uh, uh, phase, a CN ratio in the range of about 20 to 1 to 30 to 1. So 20 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. By introducing greater amounts of nitrogen, you're going to offset that CN ratio. Um, so certainly, you know, this is an appropriate range. Uh, ideally, around 30 to 1 ratio is what's, uh, what's being focused on in terms of more optimization of composting. In terms of moisture content, a range of about 45 to 55% uh, volumetric uh, um, uh, moisture content within piles. Important for aeration is to have fairly high porosity, in excess of about 40%. So having, having a material that's got a fairly high porosity rate is going to be important. pH certainly um, is a wide range in terms of optimization of compost, but uh, certainly in the ballpark of around 6 to 9 uh, pH values is going to be key. And certainly you see some lack of performance with reduced the pH ranges, but certainly uh, pH is usually not a limiting characteristic of effective composting. And then if that's all done, you should see um, temperatures in your compost pile that range anywhere from about 45 up to 65 um, degrees Celsius on an ongoing basis. So the ideal CN ratio, as I've already pointed out, is around 30 to 1. Um, and again, as I said, certainly a range that's appropriate of 20 to 1. When you have less than 30 CN ratio, certainly that does create an opportunity with excessive nitrogen within that system of uh, increasing the amount of uh, ammonia emissions or volatilization that's taking place, as well as potentially odor emissions coming from those compost piles. When you have greater than 30 to 1 on, uh, CN ratio, certainly the, uh, the amount of nitrogen in that system is limited, and certainly it's, um, uh, what that does is it minimizes the growth and certainly the activity of microbes within that compost system. And then what that does is certainly generates less heat and certainly reduces the degradation rate of that compost over time. So certainly um, uh, a key parameter for, for certainly better understanding how well your compost system works is actually measuring that CN ratio throughout the compost process. Um, so, so again, as we said, 31 is the kind of the optimum rates. Here's some ranges of CN ratios for other feedstock materials that we usually consider. So dairy manure, so solid dairy manure is going to have a CN ratio of anywhere from around 10 to 1 to 20 to 1, depending on the production system. Certainly, as you can see, you know, leaves have a, a wide range of CN ratios, depending on their age, anywhere from 30 to 80 to 1. 
Um, straw, uh, fairly large, uh, 40 to uh, 150 to 1. Corn silage, around 40 to 1. And certainly hay in a range of around 15 to, to 30 to 1. But as you can see, sawdust certainly is a very unique in its properties, uh, um, having a small uh, volume but the high a uh, relative uh, CN ratio that ranges anywhere from as low as 200 to 1 all the way up to 700 to 1, uh, the CN ratio. So very little sawdust added to manure is required to manage a, a, a CN ratio of approximately 30 to 1 uh, as an ongoing ratio. So again, that's why it's certainly been identified as, as a key carbon source of choice for certainly doing manure composting. Um, temperature is really important as well, and uh, certainly, you know, key for us is to make sure that um, that through positive biological activity, you're going to see um, significant increases in temperature. So uh, it's really a key driver of certainly activity within your pile, having a, having a positive um, uh, temperature response. Certainly, you know, if, uh, it's important too to optimize temperature and maintain a, 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 an optimum temperature over extended periods. So really what that does is it helps, as we've already heard about plenty of times, kills pathogens and viruses. Certainly it also maintains a positive balance in terms of uh, the moisture content within your system and it also creates with, with respect to maintaining that optimum temperature uh, a, a positive and conducive environment for microbes to exist. Um, oxygen is also key for the production of compost as well as we've already talked about. Certainly maintaining fairly high anaer uh, aerobic conditions is essential for effective composting and certainly when you're maintaining high oxygen levels uh, with uh, certainly there's a, uh, the composition is enhanced with microorganism activity. Uh, when you have less oxygen, so more anaerobic conditions, certainly uh, less uh, oxygen is available for these compost systems. And certainly um, you have issues uh, regarding uh, um, uh, the impact that that has on odor production, certainly the decreased temperatures that exist within these systems, but also the potential for ammonia and methane emissions to occur from these piles. And we've seen plenty of evidence of that. So many um, active compost systems actually either use passive of, uh, uh, comp uh, aeration techniques or forced aeration techniques and certainly I'll talk in a few minutes about some of the tillage and cultivation considerations within compost back burns but certainly that's an important characteristic in terms of making sure that you're achieving high oxygenation and high aeration capacity within your systems is frequent tillage. Um, moisture content in the range of around 45 to 55 percent is appropriate so uh, um, certainly when you see less than 45%, so reduced uh, moisture contents within your systems, you're essentially reducing the efficiencies of microbes within your piles to, uh, to carry out metabolic activities. But uh, certainly when you have higher moisture contents, certainly uh, that creates uh, um, a significant amount of uh, anaerobic microbes that certainly will, will decrease the uh, decomposition rates within your compost systems as well. So um, the very limited uh, kind of range from 45 to 55% but certainly key for the success of a composting system to really pay very close attention to that throughout the entire compost process. And certainly we hear back from a lot of producers that the problems that they have is actually um, maintaining fairly appropriate or lower amounts of uh, uh, moisture content. So it's another key parameter along with the carbon nitrogen ratio to measure on an ongoing basis. So uh, certainly, as we've already talked about, compost bedded pack barns are certainly gaining their popularity. And the way to think about these is actually that we're not using the complete full uh, approach to compost, but really using kind of a, um, a utilizing a partial or a surface composting strategy um, with uh, the operations of these systems. So certainly, you know, it's going to be important for these systems certainly to have uh, the appropriate nitrogen and moisture um, uh, balance. The nitrogen and moisture primarily provided through um, manure additions as well as urine from the, uh, from the herd on, on these uh, packs. And we've even seen some situations where at times during the summer months when you've got high evaporation rates, a need for supplemental water to really make sure that your moisture contents were appropriate. Certainly um, anaerobic uh, conditions are maintained on these uh, systems through frequent tillage. And we have a wide range of approaches that have been taken here in Ontario in terms of how frequently uh, uh, packs are tilled, but certainly we can talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, certainly, you know, the, the key thing about compost bedded pack barns is the fact that they're generating heat. 
And then that heat creates certainly a dry and warm packed surface that really supports opportunities around cow comfort. And as we've already heard uh, uh, earlier, certainly effective composting is critical to cow hygiene. And so better understanding some of these attributes within a pack and, and uh, being able to manage uh, appropriate temperatures for extended periods of time are going to be really essential for certainly op op optimizing certainly some of the herd health considerations. Um, so um, a number of kind of benefits certainly have been identified through a number of uh, different studies to look at. Um, you know, what are the key kind of uh, benefits of, uh, of compost bed of pack barns? Certainly, uh, there's been a, a few studies done, primarily in Kentucky, where they've identified certainly decreased somatic cell count for uh, herd health considerations, certainly um, considerations around enhanced animal comfort associated with, the, uh, with these systems. Certainly, there's, there is a valuable end product, uh, the, the compost that's uh, produced within the packs that can be used for a lot of purposes. But also, too, we're seeing uh, with these is the reduced liquid manure storage requirements. So certainly within the bedded packs, certainly the reduced volumes from those systems, but also the opportunities for reducing the, 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 the volume of uh, liquid manure that needs to be managed. From an environmental perspective, certainly um, we're going to be researching as we move forward, you know, better aspects associated with um, reduced feedlot runoff, um, reduced greenhouse gases, ammonia emission reductions, as well as odor emission reductions from these systems, again, if managed properly. Um, there was a study done in Kentucky a few years ago where they evaluated from 43 different compost bedded pack barns, and I believe that 42 of the 43 indicated that they were very positive with respect to these systems in terms of their, their, their performance. Um, in terms of the responses from each of the producers from these, things, uh, from these systems, around two-thirds indicated that the the, the key attribute was uh, cow comfort. So 67% uh, found that uh, cow comfort was one of the kind of key benefits of these systems. Cleanliness, about a third. A reduced maintenance by about a quarter of the producers. Um, and certainly a number of other uh, benefits that were identified in terms of supporting um, uh, opportunities for, for these systems to be much more widely adopted in the future. Um, in terms of these systems as well, as we've already said, uh, key is certainly the bedding material that's being used. We just heard a lot of other considerations regarding bedding, but certainly, you know, there's a number of different options that have been explored, everything from sawdust to wood shavings, wood chips being used in some operations, chopped straw, flax straw, as well as wheat straw uh, that's been, uh, been used within th these production systems. But certainly, as we've already heard, because of that positive CN ratio and the value that that provides, uh, sawdust certainly is, is being seen by many of our producers here in Ontario as the best option. And as we've already talked about, it's got a low uh, volume of material for the highest CN ratio. It's ease of handling. Um, certainly it provides a comfortable surface area. And uh, the key challenge that we continue to face though is identifying and, and sourcing out long term um, 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 s sources for where sawdust can be applied or, or be provided on an ongoing basis. But again, we're seeing that many producers are actually starting to find some longer term uh, sources of this and certainly that's providing a solid framework for them to be able to continue to uh, build on these systems. In terms of the tillage considerations, um, you know, what we're seeing on average is around twice daily would be the recommended tillage within these compost bedded pack systems and only tilling down to around 18 to 24 centimeters. So as I've talked about already, uh, these are partial systems. You're not composting the entire pack, just that surface to really optimize the temperature considerations and the heat within these within, within those packs. And again, what we're seeing too is that uh, a wide range of different uh, tillage systems are being adopted uh, depending on the burn design as well as what's uh, available Available within that uh, within that dairy operation, uh, and here's an example of uh, one barn that we're doing a little bit of work on. And certainly, uh, shortly after tillage, you can see, you know, a, a, about a 20 centimeter um, uh, a, a tire uh, a compaction area, but certainly um, creating a significant. Um, uh, um, opportunity through that tillage in that top uh, 20 to 25 centimeters. Um, we did it back in 2017 uh, with uh, the leadership of uh, Tom Wright. We uh, surveyed a number of existing um, uh, PAC systems here in Ontario. Um, and um, you know, what we saw was a su substantial uh, difference in terms of the density. I think, I believe the, uh, the current code of practice is around 120 square feet of pack per cow. Uh, and we're seeing some systems that are as low as 
50 square feet per cow, some as high as over 150 square feet. You can see though, in terms of their tillage systems and their operations, all using slightly different uh, uh, mechanized systems. And then the frequency at which they're tilling their, their, um, their packs vary. Certainly we're talking to many of these producers to really see what we can do to better optimize that. As you'll see too, the, the cost in terms of uh, the bedding material per cow per day has ranged substantially based on the availability of what they're using. So as low as 22 cents um, per uh, cow per day, up to a dollar three per cow per day. And certainly working at trying to find ways of working with each of these producers to reduce these costs uh, through better optimizing um, and, and better understanding those things that we've already talked about, the carbon, nat carbon nitrogen ratio, as well as other key considerations that are important for effective composting. In terms of adding bedding to these pack systems too, we saw a wide range of differences, everywhere from um, individuals um, uh, adding uh, 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 bedding material 14 times a week all the way down to every other week in terms of bedding material being added. So that's an important consideration that we need to look at and I think the, the, the key attribute of these systems is everyone is different. And so looking at different uh, carbon sources or bedding materials, as well as different um, uh, uh, considerations in terms of the designs of those systems, as well as the tillage considerations, it's important to be able to provide a, a better understanding on a site-specific basis of how to optimize these systems. And so part of our uh, goal moving forward as a small growing research group is to actually find ways of how we can really better work with each individual producer to provide a framework for how they can effectively do that. Um, certainly some of the key at attributes of what they found were flaws in uh, or challenges in pack barns through a study done in Kentucky. Certainly design flaws in the barn uh, were, were certainly identified as a key challenge, recognizing that many of these systems have been retrofit from, from, uh, from uh, tie stall systems at times or, or, or free stalls. Certainly stocking density, so that density of pack available has been a challenge for many uh, operations. Certainly the inability or the uh, ineffectiveness of tillage to actually optimize um, uh, the, um, the compost has been identified as a key and again I think that goes back to better understanding basic composting principles and building those into your management systems. Insufficient bedding volumes again utilized so trying to certainly find ways of better utilizing that as well as a type of bedding material as well and again uh, often based on availability. Um, some producers have found certainly with, with uh, not having the appropriate machinery some tractor compaction issues and many producers are certainly struggling with how we then do clean outs once or twice a year and then reinitiate that pack uh, early on right afterwards too. So we're working with a number of producers on, on how we optimize that moving forward. Certainly here in Ontario, we did a similar kind of assessment of those seven farms. Certainly fog being a problem in the wintertime, as I said, certainly with high evaporation rates and cooler temperatures, you're getting significant fog buildup in, in many of these um, facilities for extended periods of time. Uh, trouble keeping the pack uh, dry during the winter time uh, in particular has been a problem and I think that there's ways through better understanding the compost process that we can optimize that. Um, again, also just not really knowing when to add uh, um, the appropriate amount of bedding and, and to, to build that strong recipe into your management system is going to be key. Um, as I've already pointed out, lack of reliability of, um, of uh, sawdust supplies, um, uh, teat cleanliness prior to new bedding. So when you're, when you're um, adding new bedding material, how you manage that during those periods, as well as what we talked about to stocking density. So, um, you know, here's uh, uh, an example too of just the fog buildup that you can see in some of these systems. And again, uh, these happen in response to the high evaporation rates coming off these uh, packs. Um, so, as I've talked about too, we're doing just some preliminary research as a group moving forward. We're working with three different um, barns in the region right now. And again, uh, uh, some OMAFRA folks at Canada, some folks from the University of Guelph, and um, and uh, certainly my role from Wilfrid Laurier University. So what we're trying to better kind of focus on is better understanding um, uh, you know, issues around pack compost conditions. So we're measuring things like packed surface temperature continuously with infrared thermometers at each of these farms and also measuring uh, with, um, with uh, uh, thermometers um, compost temperatures to lower depths, but really trying to get a better sense of how well and how sustained heating is within these systems and then what we can do to better optimize that for prolonged periods. We've actually got some sophisticated uh, heat map uh, systems so we can continuously measure the, uh, uh, the, um, the surface temperatures with heat maps. 
um, in uh, each of these barns, and also really looking clearly, as I've said, about heat loss considerations. Um, also trying to better understand you know, issues about pack clean out, but also reestablishment of the pack. What are the, the best practices to uh, really optimize that? Um, also too, trying to better understand some of the manure efficiencies achieved with packs, as well as uh, the potential for uh, manure uh, to be managed as a liquid in the alleyways. Um, starting to focus more on cow behavior and certainly what some of the attributes are in terms of, in terms of behavior associated with these systems, and also doing some uh, work on measuring greenhouse gases coming off these pack barns as well as, well as ammonia emissions. Um, so clean out has been a key working with producers to really better optimize that and certainly there's, a, there's the ability to, to take those cleaned out uh, packs and actually then use a secondary uh, uh, composting phase to really provide a valuable end product if, if they uh, wish to, to use that for commercial purposes. Um, again, reestablishing the pack um, after clean out is something we've been looking at. How you balance certainly the carbons or uh, sawdust base on these with respect to a, a new um, uh, uh, compost that you add to begin that comp or you, to begin that pack development process. Most producers are looking at cleaning out at least twice a year, certainly some that are doing it once a year, but there might even be opportunities for pack clean out to occur more frequently than that. Uh, we've actually set up on, a, on one of our uh, cooperating farms um, an open path ammonia laser system so we're able to actually continuously measure ammonia emissions coming off these systems so to really see if you're getting enhanced emissions um, after um, uh, carbon addition periods as well so we're going to be focusing a little bit of that. Here's just some concentration data that we collected earlier this spring over two consecutive days and you can see certainly uh, with differences in ventilation rates we're seeing differences in concentration we have to yet convert these into flux measurements to really get a better sense of how and when uh, ammonia is being uh, generated in a minute. And then here's a picture of the heat maps that we're generating as well. So these are continuously being recorded within, within, with our sensors within these barns. And so we can certainly see what the current temperatures are of many of these packs subsequent to uh, uh, tillage, but also be able to measure um, the heat loss from these systems over time. Again, during periods of the year, uh, the goal is to optimize how long you can sustain uh, optimum temperatures within these systems based on how you manage that compost at the surface. And uh, certainly also measuring for a number of these barns, certainly the manure production within the alleyways, as well as um, uh, getting a sense of the, the frequency at which cows are on the packs, and then to calculate what the manure production added to these packs would be as well. So better understanding kind of the balance of where and when manure is being produced is another key consideration that I think will help us better kind of manage and, and, and assess how we can, uh, we can build our confidence in these systems moving forward. So um, just to finish off, um, certainly there's growing interest for these systems here in, uh, in Ontario. We formed um, a, a working group that is going to be exploring issues, um, uh, ad identifying longer term priorities for how we can optimize these systems. Um, certainly uh, we're going to be exploring how we access research funding, but also providing some extension uh, education and training considerations. In particular, how we can better understand principles of compost technology to really optimize the systems uh, that exist here already, but also new producers that are thinking of moving into these areas. So that's going to be key to us, is really um, a better understanding compost, but then um, developing rules of thumb for each existing uh, operation and how we can certainly make sure that we're optimizing these processes. Certainly we're assessing different bedding types and sources, how we can certainly build those into our planning. And also I think it's important too for us to continue to build on how we can link effective composting of these pack beds with herd health considerations as well. So we're going to be building up some uh, plans around that. But also I think also exploring what the environmental footprint of these systems are compared to other different types of production systems as well. So not a lot of new data for you here today, but certainly a real commitment by a number of individuals to really start to assess these systems better and then to add value to certainly and answer some questions that have been identified in terms of their long-term performance. So uh, thank you for your time, um, and uh, certainly I'd be more than happy to answer any questions, but um, look forward to continuing on working with um, many people in the industry to really see how we can further build up our, our, our understanding of these systems and how we can certainly extend that to producers in terms of their satisfaction, but also the value that these systems may provide us moving forward. So thank you very much, everybody.